Well, I'm Bill Bronson from here in Great Falls, Montana, and I'm here today with Brian Morgan to share a few stories about Charlie Russell and his art. From a historical standpoint, uh, Russell was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1864. His father was a fairly prominent businessman in St. Louis at the time. This is right around the tail end of the Civil War. Charlie, it's safe to say, was not the ideal student. Um, his parents had hoped uh, that he would have a great career ahead of him, much as did his father. Uh, but uh, he had other things in mind. He had read some of the early, what we would call sort of pulp stories about the West, and was fascinated with this idea about traveling to the West and, and becoming a cowboy. And he kept arguing with his parents about the subject, and they sent him to military school in hopes that they might be able to bring him in, but that was not successful. And finally, when he was about 16 years of age, he wore his parents down and persuaded them that he should be allowed to travel out west, which they allowed him to do. And so in 1880, uh, with another individual, he came out to what is now Helena, Montana, with the idea that he was eventually going to find some work uh, on some of the early ranches uh, that were being developed. Now at that time, ranches were not like they are today. Uh, most people who had any kind of cattle would simply take them to an area uh, where there was a lot of grass and just turn them loose. We didn't have the idea of fenced-in ranches or farms at that time. It was the open range which is critical to the story that I'll tell you here momentarily about the piece of art that he did that really started him on the road to fame. But he actually uh, started uh, working uh, around 1880, I think it was 1882, he became what we call a night wrangler, where he would be responsible for keeping track of all the horses that the cowboys rode during the evenings while they were resting, and Charlie's job was to make sure that all the horses stayed together and didn't get run off for one reason or another. But he did that type of work and other work, and in the fall of 1886, he was uh, working for a fellow by the name of Jesse Phelps, who had a ranch called the OH, and it was located in what we now call the Judith Basin. This particular ranch was east of a small community called Utica, Montana, which is also still there today. Great hamburgers, by the way, at the bar, if you ever have a time to stop in the Utica. But uh, that winter was like most of the winters that these young men had known for the previous five or six years. And Jesse Phelps was responsible for keeping track of a herd of about 5,000 cattle owned by some butchers in Helena, Montana, sort of the original farm to market concept. But no one was prepared for the winter of 1886-87. Uh, it started out fairly mild. By January of 1887, uh, it had actually gotten fairly warm. And the grass was out there, and the cattle were beginning to feed, and everything seemed fine until a real nasty storm came in from the north, uh, not only extreme snow, but extreme cold as well. And very quickly, that grass that had been coming up was covered, and ice formed on it, and the cattle could not feed. Uh, and they eventually, uh, as happens in that situation many times, uh, they began to get sick, they lose weight, uh, and eventually they die. Uh, and they become fodder for the wolves and the coyotes that had hung out in those parts for years. Uh, and the coyotes still do, as a matter of fact. But anyway, uh, Jesse Phelps uh, needed to report to Louie Kaufman down in Helena what was the status of the herd. And he said, I'm going to write a letter uh, to Mr. Kaufman and tell him that things don't look good. And Russell had a notion. Uh, he'd already been doing a little bit of art at that time. He said, well, I'll paint a picture of what's happening out here, and you could include that in the letter to Mr. Kaufman. And this was the origin of what 
Russell called waiting for a Chinook, but eventually became known as the last of the 5,000, a reference to the size of Kaufman's herd. And Russell essentially took the back of a little box uh, that they used for the old paper collars they used to have at that time. And just using some very dark and dank colors, he painted a picture of a steer that was completely emaciated. Uh, its tail, if you knew anything about cattle, you could tell that the tail was worn down, which was a sign that wild animals had noted that it was in distress and they were starting to nibble away. Uh, I've, I've actually seen that happen. I saw an instance of that here about a month and a half ago when I was down on a ranch southeast of Dillon where the coyotes were starting to come out uh, when the cattle were young. It's a cattleman's worst fear. Horrible thing today, it was a horrible thing in the 1880s. But in any event, uh, Russell painted this little picture of the steer, emaciated, you could tell it was probably on its last legs, with the wolves just sort of circling around, just waiting for the right moment of weakness or death uh, to pounce for the last time. Long story short, Russell gives this little painting to Jesse Phelps and say, here, you can include this with the letter. And I think most Russell biographers have reported that Phelps looked at that and said, I don't have to send a letter. This picture says it all. And so they sent the picture to Coffin. He got the message right away about what was happening to his herd. But Coffman did a very interesting thing. He just didn't keep that little painting to himself. He shared it with his friends at Helena. And within a matter of weeks, there were stories circling around Helena and much of what was then the southern part of Montana about this young cowboy artist out in the middle of the Judith Basin by the name of Charlie Russell. And that, I think it's safe to say, was probably the beginning of his real career uh, doing what he probably did best was documenting the story of the West as he saw it, as he experienced it, and uh, sharing it with the rest of the world. And again, there's, there are people far better qualified than I am to talk about the importance of that little piece as a work of art. Uh, but for a lot of us, that's the beginning of the story of Charlie Russell. Again, the only thing I guess I can share about it is the significance of that little painting to me uh, actually was something that I experienced in my own life. About 1964-65, we had a horrible, horrible winter up on the High Line where I was growing up as a kid. And my dad uh, ran a branch office of an implement dealership at the time. And uh, during the spring of 1965, as I did a lot of times when school was out, I would travel with my dad to visit a lot of his customers. And we were traveling south of Malta, Montana, on the way down toward what's now the Fred Robinson Bridge across the Missouri River. And I remember my dad and I seeing the remains of cattle huddled up against the fences on what would be the east side of the highway there, near some of the properties of the land dad's customers. And of course, these are the remains of emaciated cattle that had all bunched together in the winter and had died because the ranchers couldn't get to them at the time. When you see that and then you see Russell's picture, uh, which as I said, he called it waiting for a Chinook, the hope that southerly wind would come in and be everybody's salvation. Uh, but everyone knows it is the last of the 5,000. I said, when you can see that in your own lifetime, you can see that happen to cattle, you have a sense of what was going through Russell's and Phelps' mind, uh, stuck out there in the middle of the prairie in 1887, getting ready to relay the bad news uh, to somebody that virtually all of your herd is gone. Well, we've come through a winter that just like it's, that. it's very reminiscent of that winter of 64 and the, and the, the, the winter that that postcard was first mailed in. And 
it makes you realize that uh, Montana as, as a land really hasn't changed much. Uh, uh, I, today, as a working artist, work in a facility that is uh, almost like this, is cabin-esque. <laughs> and um, uh, of course there are technologies that, uh, uh, that are available, but uh, Russell barely had electricity in here, and maybe even painted with kerosene lanterns at time. And I am still awestruck that he was able to produce the enormous work and the colorful work and the quality work that he did with uh, the lighting at the time. I know what it takes to create a painting with, with all kinds of different lighting. And, uh, and he worked a lot in the morning hours uh, between uh, 6 and noon. And, uh, and this is uh, southern facing, of course, but I'm thinking about how the light would have come through these windows and, and the available um, electricity um, that, that he worked with and was still able to is really a, a truly a remarkable artist and philosopher and man in his times. Uh, and I'm not surprised that, that his genius uh, came through at that young age with uh, that limited uh, resource of that, uh, uh, that, that cardboard that uh, came in a package with a shirt that launched his career.